um, that Pat and Mark is uh, coming. Yeah, sorry, it's too bad in here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another installment of Tech Munch. Uh, woo! This, yeah. Can we have more? Woo! <laughs> yeah! That's what I'm talking about. Uh, this week's topic is interesting, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure of being live. Uh, Don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm not going to take... Thing. Say what Tech Munch is. Uh, it's it's Tech Munch is, is a bi-weekly event at Translope. We talk about uh, technical matters and we munch at the same time. Um, very elaborate description. Uh, this week's uh, Tech Munch is on path tracing, uh, specifically uh, a path tracing engine written in Go, uh, the history of path tracing presented by Michael Fogelman. The illustrious. Thank Amazing. <laughs> Michael Roman. Take it away. All right. So we're going to talk about path tracing today. Um, this is not related to work, but I'm a big nerd, so I'm always programming. Not just at work, but at home. Um, earlier this year, I wrote a... Do you like? It looks very dark on the display, so I'm just wondering if... I'm wondering Ooh. how the... What are these for? I'm just wondering about the projector. It's a trade-off. I don't know. As long as the slides look all right, uh, I think it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Uh, You're in the shadows, basically. Yeah. So earlier this year, I decided to write a path tracer, which is uh, basically state-of-the-art graphics rendering. Um, so if you're following along online or you got a laptop here, you can follow. You can pull up these URLs see the slides or the code. It's on GitHub. It's written in Go. So what is path tracing anyway? Um, it's basically a realistic rendering engine algorithm that basically simulates how light actually behaves in the physical world. So it's also called like physically based rendering. Um, so if you've ever seen a movie modern animation film by Disney or Pixar or whoever, this, these frames are basically rendered using path tracing. So path tracing falls under, it's like under the umbrella of global illumination algorithms, and that basically just means that it considers not only direct lighting in the scene, but also indirect lighting. So there's a blue wall over there, and some sunlight is hitting that blue wall, and that is going to it's going to provide a blue tint um, to other objects in the room. Um, this rendering equation was developed in 1986, so it's fairly modern. Uh, it looks like crazy math, but basically all this really I'm not I'm only going to scratch the surface in the, in the technical details in this talk. Um, what all this is really saying is that the color of an object basically depends on two things. Its own emittance, if it's a light source, like the sun or a light bulb, um, and the sum total of all right light reflected from all directions. So if you have some object and light is coming in from all angles, the surface normal here. So if the light hits, it's going to bounce off in, anywhere in this hemisphere. Um, so. But don't Let's worry about cross here. Yeah. Let's see. So path tracing is what's known as a Monte Carlo algorithm, which basically means you randomly simulate these light rays bouncing around the scene and you simulate billions of these rays just to render a single image. Um, I alluded to the Disney animations. Uh, when they render a production film, they have a huge server farm for rendering, and they spend about 30 minutes of CPU time per frame to render just a single image. So probably 24 or 30 or frames per second, uh, 
that's a lot of CPU time for an entire film. Uh, so every single pixel in the image is going to have hundreds or even thousands of rays shooting through that pixel to sample all the different ways light can bounce around the scene after going through that pixel. And since it's a randomized algorithm, uh, it's not deterministic. You get different results every time you run it. But the longer you run it, you convert. You basically can converge on a solution and eliminate all the noise from the image. So here's a diagram showing basically how ray tracing works. So you have a three-dimensional scene with some three-dimensional objects in it. You specify where the camera is and where it's looking. And you have some image that you're rendering into with some number of pixels. You have a width and a height of your image. You're going to shoot a ray through each of these pixels. And what a pass rate. Let's do it in one go. Come on, guys. There's two seats there. <laughs> What the path tracer is going to do is figure out which object in the scene that ray hits first. So this top red ray hits the top of the sphere here. And now we need to figure out what color is the sphere there. So we do a couple things. We first cast what's called a shadow ray to all of the light sources in the scene to see if, it's, if there's anything blocking it. So in this case, this point is illuminated by this light because there's, there's nothing in between. But down here, where we're in the shadow, this shadow ray, when it's trying to go to this light source, it's going to intersect this sphere, which means we're in a shadow. So we're, we are not directly illuminated by this light source. So we can compute um, the color of this point based on that. But what we further do is, which is not shown in the diagram, we recursively shoot more rays in random directions all around here until we, maybe there's another sphere over here and maybe it's blue, like my marker. So we cast this ray, we figure out we're in a shadow, but we also want to know if we're indirectly illuminated. So this guy could be lit, and it could bounce some blue light down into the shadow and cast a blue tint on the floor. And that's the main difference between path tracing and ray tracing. Uh, ray tracing doesn't really handle indirect illumination. And this, when you're trying to make something look realistic, this makes a huge difference. So just to recap the basic algorithm, for each pixel in the image, you're going to cast the ray from the camera and through the pixel. And you'll actually subsample that pixel. So if you're going to shoot multiple rays at three different points in the pixel. So if this is one pixel, you might shoot a ray through the middle, over here, 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 here. And you'll get, that'll give you nice anti-aliasing as you render the image. So if you have a sphere and your pixel falls at the edge, you're going to get some of the color of the sphere, but also whatever's behind it. Nice blending there. And for each of those rays, you determine the object in the scene that, it gets, that hits it. Do the shadow rays for the direct lighting and recursive rays for the indirect lighting, just like we talked about in the diagram. So we recursively cast rays to get indirect lighting, but how many times do we repeat it? Like, the light might hit the whiteboard, the table, that blue wall, before finally coming to my eye. There's several bounces there. And what I'm going to show now is some renderings from my path tracer where I use different recursion depths to, so we can see exactly what happens. So here I'm not bouncing at all. I'm just casting a ray from the camera to the scene. And I'm checking the, the direct lighting. So I am getting shadows here. And I, I get a nice light fall off uh, as you travel down the sphere here. But it looks pretty flat. If we go to the next slide, we are doing one bounce. So you can see we're now seeing reflections in, in the spheres. So shoot a ray, hit this guy, maybe it bounces over to the blue ball, and we can, so we can see the blue ball in a reflection. But now watch what happens when we go to two. Now light is bouncing off of the yellow ball and slightly illuminating the floor. And if you do three, you get some more illumination back from that yellow reflection, so the bottom gets a little brighter again, and so on. And you can keep doing this more and more, but you get 
and the machine returns. Uh, you can't really tell the difference between 8 and 16. Most of the rays by that point have left the scene because I don't, it's not a contained scene, there's like an empty sky. So once it shoots out to infinity, it's not coming back. So another big thing about path tracing is noise. It's an iterative process. You can let it render as long as you want. Um, if you just, so this, these frames are gonna show successively repeating iterations to reduce noise in the image. So after just one iteration, we have a lot of noise because we haven't sampled enough light rays to really determine the color. You know, we might have happened to go out into the black sky too many times to really have gotten a correct sampling of the hemisphere uh, that the rays could possibly shoot through. So as you keep going further and further in, you're just reducing the noise there. And you just, like I said, 30 minutes for a frame in an animation film, that's just some, what they target, but that's about what they need to get a, a reasonable level of noise. Sometimes the noise is nice because it kind of makes it look a little realistic, <coughs> like, a, like a real photograph, but you don't want too much, obviously. Film that thing. It comes for free. <laughs> um, another big thing in path tracing are material types. So here I've rendered multiple spheres with different material properties. And here they're labeled. This guy is perfectly diffuse. What that means is light ray comes in, hits this surface here. Here's the surface normal at that point. It's, light will be equally reflected in all directions in this hemisphere of 180 degrees. Um, there's no bias anywhere else. Whereas specular, a lot of the rays are gonna reflect like a mirror, um, like a perfect reflection about the normal. And that's how you get this mirror effect. Um, and it's actually, that the amount of reflection depends on the angle. So if you take an object that's kind of shiny and you look at it at a glancing angle, you'll see a whole lot more reflection than at more head on angles. It's basically just proportional to the cosine of the angle. Diffuse materials don't really exist in nature, perfectly diffuse. Um, chalk is kind of close. And all of these parameters are configurable. Like you're specifying the refractive index of the material here. For glossy, it's all like specular, except the reflection gets perturbed a little bit. So if it comes in, and it's gonna reflect about that normal, it'll actually reflect within a cone around that normal, around that reflected ray. So you can specify that angle to tweak the amount of glossiness. These other two are transparent materials. One is tinted and one is perfectly clear. So I'll get these cool little, uh, you can see the light reflect going through the sphere and onto the floor. And here it's kind of bluish on the floor. And then up here we have a perfectly reflective material, so basically like a mirror. And you can see the light source, which is above all the material spheres. <clears throat> I rendered this one last night, uh, overnight. It takes a long time for complicated uh, geometries. Um, so this is like a frosted glass kind of material. This is called the Stanford Dragon. It's uh, not their mascot or anything, but their computer graphics department um, did like a 3D scan of this dragon they had, and they use it for testing computer graphics rendering. It contains about 900,000 triangles. It's a giant triangle mesh, which is a important thing to talk about with performance, which I'm about to get to in a minute. So there's primitive types of shapes that you can render spheres and cubes, but most interesting things are made up of triangle meshes, like this dragon. And these can be looked, there's two common file formats, there's OBJ and STL. STL is popular with 3D printing, um, but it, it only has triangle data. It doesn't give you material properties or textures or colors or anything like that, whereas OBJ does provide that information. So this was loaded from an OBJ file, but I specified the material properties in this case. 
in this image I made, there's a light source above the dragon, but there's also an ambient like sky color that's kind of an orangish. So like I said, that dragon has 900,000 triangles. So every time we shoot a ray through the scene, we need to figure out what triangle it is. We can't iterate over all 900,000 triangles and test, does this ray hit this triangle? We need some kind of uh, data structure to speed that up. And one very common one is called a KD tree. It's basically a, a space partitioning tree. So I can draw it in 2D. So in 2D we have two axes, X and Y. Now let's say we have some, I'll just do points instead of triangles. We have some points in the scene. And we want to, what, we're, what a KD tree does, in this case it's a 2D tree, I suppose. Um, you pick an axis, either X or Y, and then you pick a partitioning point. So you might partition on in the X here. And then everything to the left of that partition goes in one half of the tree, and everything to the right goes in the other half. And you repeat this process, and you try to pick a point where you kind of half, you have half on one side and half on the other side. Something like this. Just kind of picking it up. So now if we want to find out what points exist like around here, we basically traverse the tree. Well, we're on the right side of the top level partition, so we're, we know where it's none of these points. We're below this partition, so it's none of those points. We don't have to iterate through all the points. And basically, it becomes a logarithmic time check. So, be basically way faster. <laughs> Textures. So I found this model online, um, a zebra. And what happens in this case is, it, again, it's a triangle mesh, but we have a texture image. And each triangle has texture coordinates. So here's a triangle. Our texture is just a giant, like PNG or JPEG. And Maybe the colors for this triangle exist in some area in this texture. So they're called UV coordinates. So here's U and V. So each of these vertices of the triangle reference inside of this texture where to get their texture from. And then you interpolate across this triangle using very centric coordinates um, to determine the colors within. So you, you know what point in the texture these all are, but to figure out the actual color for this point, we can interpolate inside of it. And you can do more than textures with that. You can do normal mapping or bump mapping, which can give you a higher, higher level of detail in the lighting effects. Like if you have like a bumpy, rough surface, you don't necessarily want to model that in your triangle mesh with like billions of triangles to get all every little detail. You can just use a bump map specify how light will react at that point. Okay. Here are some examples from my path tracer. Um, here's some Lego bricks. Um, a guy I follow on Twitter created a 3D model of a Lego using OpenSCAD, um, probably for 3D printing or something, but I thought it was cool, so I took it. I looked up the actual Lego colors, put them in there, and then just randomly placed some bricks everywhere and rendered it. So in this case, there's no light source. Um, there's just an ambient sky color of white, pure white. So what happens is everything's lit, but when you have these areas in the shadows, so you shoot a ray in there, it kind of bounces around a few times, it probably gets stuck. Um, and if you hit your max recursion depth, then it, it looks like it's black in there. So, and you average out, so after shooting thousands of rays, you'll kind of average out how many times it escaped, how many times it got stuck in there, and you basically get how, how much shadow is in that area. This is the Go Gopher. He's the mascot of the Go programming language. Um, 
my path tracer was written in Go, so I felt I should render the Go gopher. Um, you probably should mention what Rob Pike thought of this. I tweeted it, and Rob Pike, one of the creators of Go, was like, well, that's kind of cool, except I don't think his arm looks right. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Uh, I found the 3D model on uh, GitHub. Just some guy had made it. Uh, I couldn't find anything better, so I think it's pretty good. I made the floor shiny so you can see his reflection. I think David actually rendered this one. He played around with my patch picture a little bit. Um, so this is a pencil with a few different light sources, which so you actually get multiple shadows for each light source. It's really cool. So you get the really dark umbra, I think it's called, and then penumbra is where it's kind of partly in the sh shadow and partly not. And I think the writing here was actually done in tri in the triangle mesh instead of a texture. So that's just there's some rubber ducks. <laughs> There's a cool website called Thingiverse. Uh, again, it's big in 3D printing, but they have a huge library of 3D models that you can download and print. In this case, I just rendered them. Uh, so it's sort of like open source 3D models. Uh, here's some spheres. Again, there's multiple light sources, so you get really cool shadows. And everything's really reflective, so you get all these reflections and stuff, which kind of highlights the power of a path tracer versus something like OpenGL. Some cubes. This one has a light source that's kind of up over here. So things over here are like in the shadows. So if you play video games or something like that, you might wonder how these kind of you know, path tracing differs from games. Uh, OpenGL, obviously it's 3D, um, but the way it approaches rendering is totally different. Um, it's not based, in, it's not physically based rendering, it's not based on how light acts in the real world really. Um, basically, every triangle in the scene gets transformed into string coordinates. So an XY coordinate plus a depth. So like X, Y, and so Z. There's, there's a Z buffer. So every pixel that gets rendered from a triangle, it checks the Z buffer to see if anything has been there already. And then lighting is nowadays computed in a shader. Um, and it'll check where the light source is to compute. So here there's like a, this guy's darker than this guy, this face. Um, but all it's really doing is it knows the light source is over here somewhere, it can compute the angle, and it's just using the cosine of that angle to apply some factor on the on the lighting. But there's no shadows here because it's not checking if that that light is occluded. Um, because to do that in OpenGL it requires a lot of weird tricks. Um, one thing is called shadow mapping. What you actually do for shadow mapping is you render the scene in a back buffer from the point of view of the light source. And then when you do the actual render, you check that buffer to see if each pixel was visible to the camera or not when you rendered. That. Of course, that becomes very prohibitive if you have a lot of light sources. There's also no indirect lighting. So this green gear is not going to color the red gear at all. But of course, OpenGL runs real time, 60 frames a second, or even faster, obviously. Um, but this is open. So this looked really primitive and kind of crappy, but this is also OpenGL. And they got cool things like reflections in the water. Is that half left here? I think it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this looks good enough, um, but the, the main point I want to make is it's not based on realistic lighting effects. It's all textures and like tricks to make this reflection appear and stuff. It's not tracing rays. So that's the high level overview, and now I just want to do a quick. Oops. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, question. For a game like Bubsy 3D, one of the early like Sega X games, was that OpenGL or was that something different? For what they... If it was on Sega, no. I don't know what it was, but it was not OpenGL. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure anyway. 
My full day be it. But it probably followed similar principles to what, how OpenGL renders. It was totally, people hated the game because it was totally unnatural the way it rendered, so they couldn't figure out how the character was supposed to be moving. People were really disoriented by it. Mm -hmm. Uh, will there be a Q&A then? I mean, I can take any more questions now if there are any. I, just, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I remember when you first started on this, I was checking if, ha if it had any similarities to Pavre, which was a ray tracing engine. Right. And I remember you explaining the difference between path tracing and ray tracing. If you could go over that real quick. Yeah, so basically it's the indirect lighting. So you shoot a ray, so ray tracing, they're very similar but ray tracing is more deterministic. Once you compute the color of a pixel, you're done. And the way that works is you get the direct lighting from whatever object you hit, and if it's, if it's a reflective surface or a refractive surface, you'll trace rays for that as well, but you don't, you don't recursively propagate more rays to compute the indirect lighting. That's the main difference. Okay. Any more questions? All right. So, make it fun. Yeah. Don't get scared. I'm gonna write some code just to show how my path tracer in particular works. Um, to show how easy it is to render something that looks pretty cool. So this is written in Go, and we're just gonna write a main function that will use my P. It's called PT uh, library. The first thing we have to do is create a scene. Yeah will hold all the objects in our three-dimensional scene. So that's what we do for that. And we've imported my code. And then, once we have a scene, we can render it. I haven't put anything in the scene yet, but let's go ahead and uh, do this. We're gonna spit out some files as we render. Give it the scene. I'm gonna have to create a camera object to tell it where my camera is and where it's looking. Let's do 640 by 480 pixels. Let's just do let's get that guy. I'm not gonna explain all that right now. Well, basically, what I did is every time I hit an object when I shoot away from the camera, I'm gonna bounce four rays off of that one, and then I'm gonna bounce up to four times, which is usually good enough. So I gotta specify a camera. I have this look at function. This takes a few parameters. So first we specify the three-dimensional position of the eye, the camera, and then another three-dimensional position of what point we're looking at. We also have to specify an up vector because you don't know if you're like tilting your head or the camera. And then a field of view, which is in angles, uh, in degrees. So let's look at these are all vectors. We'll look at the origin from 333. Three. And we'll make Z be the up vector. And we'll just do a 65 degree field of view, which is, I think, sort of human like. Uh, let's see if this runs. Yeah, it runs real fast. There's nothing to render. So all my images are black. So we gotta put something in the scene. And the way you do that is just with scene.add. Let's create a sphere. So we have to specify the center of the sphere. Let's put it at the origin where we're looking. The radius, let's make it one. And now I have to specify a material. So I'll call this sphere material. And I'll create it up here. And I have a lot of helpers. Let me pull it up. I can cre create diffuse materials, specular, glossy, clear, etc. Let's just do a diffuse to start. Let's just make it white. I haven't added a light source, so everything's still black. Let's create a light. Call it light material. We'll make the light be white. And then it's one width. So attenuation means 
how much the light falls off with distance. In the real world, it's quadratic. You double the distance, you quarter the light. But in this case, I'm just telling you, it doesn't fall off at all. It goes to infinity. So I created the material. Now, light can be a sphere as well. We'll put it above the sphere that we're trying to render. Yeah. And you can see the light falling off as if the light was above the sphere. So that's kind of cool. Let's put a floor underneath the sphere. We can use the same material for now. So we'll call it a cube. Here you just specify the min and max bounds of this cube. I'll make it real big. Except Z is negative one because the sphere is at the origin. Okay. Slow it down a bit. So now we have a something underneath the sphere and you can see the shadow now. And let's make that a more interesting material. Let's do glossy. Still be white. But now we're going to give it a refractive index of say 1.5 and an angle to perturb that reflected light. So this runs until I kill it basically. Um, each iteration, the noise is being improved. Can't tell much difference, but it, well, you can see it's a little shinier at the top than it was. Um, anyway. So, with just a few lines of code, we can render cool stuff. Uh, any questions about the code? So, you're modeling uh, the scene in Go, just like the engine itself is written in Go? Yep. Okay. Everything's in Go. All right. There's, I don't think there's even any third-party uh, Go libraries. Maybe you should make them, or uh, maybe, maybe like there's no dependencies. So no, I, I get it. Uh, could, is there like an abstraction, something XML like, something like uh, OpenSCAD, you know? So instead of writing Go, you could just write like have some kind of markup to yeah. Add your yeah. I thought about doing something like that, but I never. I don't know if there's anything standard out there either. You want to demonstrate open this guy real quick? Sure. Open SCAD is a cool 3D modeling tool. But it, if you ever try to use something like Blender, the user interface is crazy. <laughs> I can't even figure out how to move the camera. But here, everything's like coding, so it feels natural to me at least. Um, if you write sphere 10, Hit F5, which is hard on a Mac. Now you have a sphere. But you can cool you can do cool operations like uh, intersection difference union. So let's say I had a cylinder. Let's say I want to cut a hole out of this, like a cylinder out of this sphere. Like difference. The difference between the sphere and a cylinder with radius. Three, height 10. <laughs> Make that be centered about the origin. It's going to get taller. It's not going all the way through. And once, and you, you basically build up these, you can save, you can create modules and functions that can be reused and build it up further and further until you get these really complicated 3D shapes, and then you can export it as STL. And I've actually, you know, rendered some of those things in my path tracer. Let's look at some examples. Here's one that I actually did render in a. Let's 
called a minger sponge. It's like fractal, where you just recursively take cubes out of a cube. Um, let me see if I have the example. Because I, this is just one of the OpenSCAD examples, but I, I rendered it with my path tracer. Do you have the animation? Yeah, I made an animation. Let me find it. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Light source and everything. This took my computer all night to render. <laughs> and, it, and it still got a lot of noise in it. Because um, I did 360 frames, one for each degree, around, you know, flying around this cube. The giant light source. Um, it's the food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the light coming out of the inside looks awesome. I love that. Yeah. The glowing effect. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Right there. So, so, so this brings up a, a question I have. Yeah. So, so, in the past couple of years, all the hardware companies, you know, Apple, Nvidia, Imagination Technologies, like all these guys are talking about how they're going to insert ray tracing capabilities on the hardware side, right? Into the GPU. Yeah. Obviously this is a lot of work and you couldn't render this on an iPhone. Right. Right. So so how is that going to impact what you're doing and how do you see that changing everything? So my path tracer only uses the CPU, not the GPU. The GPU would be way faster, but there's limitations. Um, and actually the thing that first inspired me to write a path tracer does use the GPU and it's in the browser even. So I can show you real quick. You can even pan around. So you see that as I change you see the noise but once you stop it it's still it's all it's constantly improving. I think you can use these guys. And there's different examples. But the way this works under the covers, you can select the light and move it around. Well, the way this works under covers is it, there's only a handful of objects in this scene and they're all being, he's dynamically compiling the shader code to include these objects in the shader code. So he's only got primitives, you know, cubes and spheres. Um, if he wanted to render that Stanford Dragon, there's like no way. Uh, it's way too much data. To, you wouldn't compile it into the shader. You need some better way of getting data to the graphics card. And there's ways to get data to the graphics card, but it's not really... The GPUs are not made to do ray tracing. They're made to do standard scan line, OpenGL style rendering. Um, there might be, you know, there's other things like OpenCL and CUDA which are for doing general purpose programming on a GPU. Um, but we still have to figure out, and that might that might work for something like a path tracer. Um, I wouldn't have to learn more personally if I was gonna try to do that, um, to, to get the data to the GPU in a format that would be able to render a scene that was complex. So when they say they're gonna incorporate ray tracing you know, on the hardware side, is that bullshit? I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not saying it's bullshit. But I mean, just... you described it earlier as kind of a more efficient way. You know, it's not as realistic as path tracing because it doesn't, you know, the light doesn't bounce as much. Or, uh, so would that be the path to go if they wanted to incorporate that into their hardware? Like GPU? I don't know. Um, I mean, without doing path tracing, you're basically working with clever tricks to make things look realistic. Um, like the OpenGL mm -hmm. style stuff. Um, hardware, I don't know what the current advances are. I've heard of Metal, which Apple is doing. Yeah. I think that's just a, sort of an OpenGL replacement that gets you a little closer to the GPU with less 
um, overhead in between your code and the GPU. I don't know if it's. But they're saying it's really up to like NVIDIA and ATI and those yeah. guys. So what, got, what, what, so what NVIDIA told me is that like for, for gaming or virtual reality, um, you'll be able to create a, a, a three dimensional scene. You'll be able to specify the light source, and as the as the gamer's playing, as it gets later in the day, the light source will automatically change and dim, and and the you know ray tracing and the you know the the, 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 the uh, you know reflections, shadows, all that kind of stuff will will change automatically, hmm. right? On the hardware side, it won't have to be programmed on the software side. Hmm. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be cool, right? So yeah. so. With that, so so in essence, you would send this scene, right? These three models, with, I guess, a light source, right? You would tell you would tell the right, and, and then say, where where is the camera? And where's the camera? Right. I should look into that. It looks cool. It sounds cool. Sam song just released some headset thing yesterday, ninety nine dollars. So you probably want to look into that. Can go mainstream. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For them. Yeah, and uh, I stumbled on this. This is Disney's Animation Studios, their renderer. They have a cool video on path tracing that if you want to watch it, if you're still curious. Oh. It's like nine or ten minutes. Um, but they're cool. So here they have a comparison, which they must have uh, modeled a real scene. So this is a real photo here versus their renderer. Wow. Wow. So, so just really in, cool. in real life, this stuff's dirtier. <laughs> <laughs> and this is kind of showing what I was showing earlier with the bounces. As you do more and more indirect lighting, you get more of that realism. This one's cool. So th this is about the presence and absence of that character in that ball. Mm -hmm. You can see its reflections and stuff in all the lab equipment. Yeah, the glass. Uh, yeah, things. exactly. Wow. So, and when I was developing my path tracer, I stumbled on some other work by Disney. So, a lot of research going into this stuff. Modeling hair is like a huge field <laughs> because it's it's too much detail to model all the hairs individually so how do you get something that looks realistic there might actually be examples of here somewhere maybe it's the other one by disney you mean pixar is that what this is basically pixar well, this is disney well not only rendering it but rendering it on a mobile device right well, see the hair <laughs> pixar. so these these movies were all rendered using essentially the same Technology that I presented today, just more, much deeper than I've gone with it. So, can you reverse engineer real pictures to figure out, kind of like forensically assess if they're legitimate or not? Whoa! <laughs> like, could you basically Very take a real thing. picture and pull it in and figure out where all the light sources are actually coming from? Like, figure out the position of the moon or something, or the sun from a real picture? Could you work backwards? Maybe to an extent, like if you had one primary light source, you could probably figure it out by just looking at a handful of pixels in the image. I don't know, but. So did you just wake up one day and you're like, I know what I need to do? <laughs> <laughs> what brought this on? This was totally for fun. Yeah. Um, I like graphics. I, a lot of my side projects are graphic related. I've done OpenGL in the past. And basically we, it was, uh, I saw that I saw this and I was like, I have to learn how to do that. <laughs> oh, and here's a book. This is like the book. Well, I always start like reading that. <laughs> yeah, you, you know how to have a good time. I'm going to party with this guy. <laughs> Physically based rendering. This goes, I didn't really read it. Hold it close to the light because it's yeah. very dark. Here. Ta da! I really only use this when I get stuck. Um, because uh, this book is really deep. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to, wants to look through it later, feel free. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, we really enjoyed this. And uh, thank you. Time for one more question? Yeah.
What do you see as the use cases? For, like, what are the most interesting use cases for you in the near term? Is it virtual reality type inclusion, or is it just more having fun with graphic rendering? Virtual reality has to be real time. So until we get to the level where we can render this kind of thing in real time, I don't know. Um, I just I like just being able to render more realistic looking images um, if I'm making some kind of visualization or something. But I mean, mainly it's just animation films is probably the top use case right now. But also, you know, if you're an architect or something and you want to render what a building's going to look like, that would be a use case. Um, Can you get to real time rendering through incremental increases, or is it going to take something like quantum level stuff to happen? I mean, if, if what Brad's talking about is actually happening, getting this stuff hardware accelerated, it, it might only be like five or 10 years in the future to have this kind of thing in real time. I don't know. But it's a matter of the device, right? You're doing it on. Yeah. Right? So, so you know, already there's devices that can <clears throat> render in real time uh, realistic, you know, 3D images. And what what makes the realism, as, as, as you mentioned, right? You have your texture, you have your lighting, and you have your shading. Right, and that's those. Those are what make you feel something is real as opposed to not real. That's the difference between like a good three D model that immerses you in it, and one that sucks. It looks like you know it's yes. just a project. What's that thing called where something looks uncanny almost, valley? The uncanny valley is interesting. If you never heard of it, yeah, it's when something fake or computer rendered or even like a robot human yeah. looks almost human but not quite. It's like your brain freaks out and like rejects it completely. Yeah, the classic example is like a doll, like a, a very lifelike doll looks quite terrifying. Whereas like a child stuffed doll doesn't usually freak anybody out. Um, the, the, the biological um, reasoning behind that basically is that you should be afraid of dead things. So yeah. if you see a person that looks almost alive but not quite, you should probably get away from whatever is going on there. <laughs> yeah. And so that extends to like creepy mannequins in the dark and you know robots that almost nail being a human but instead are like super super scary. Which is why um, the new Asimo robot does not look like people because they don't want anyone to be scared of it. They just want him to look cute. So uncanny valley, yeah. That's the one. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Michael. That's cool. <laughs> Next tech luncheon, couple weeks. weeks. Yeah, we'll let you know what the subject is. <laughs>